So a very warm welcome to everyone who's attending this evening, whether you're a member or a supporter of Christian Engineers in Development or CED for short, or maybe you have no prior connection with CED and heard about it through some other channel. Whatever the case, you're most welcome. My name's Mike Beresford. I'm one of the directors for CED, and this is the third of our CED Tech Talks. And these talks came about after CED finalized our strategic plan. One of our priorities, uh, and it's not specifically aimed at me, is to focus on knowledge and skills. Um, th this has two aspects. Firstly, we want to increase our own level of understanding about development technology. And secondly, we wish to share uh, the knowledge that we have with others in our field of work. And we'll be doing that both through this meeting and through publishing uh, this talk afterwards uh, on the internet through our website and the YouTube channel. In a minute, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan Cox, uh, who's one of our members, who's an expert on micro hydro. And he's going to speak from the wilds of West Wales uh, in a talk entitled Micro Hydro Technology and Opportunities. We're very grateful that you've joined us, John O, for the time that you put into preparing this talk. And we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So over to you. I think you should be able to share your screen. So I'm going to try and spotlight you as well. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Mike, for that. I'm just going to try to share a screen. And hopefully you can see that now. Yeah, it's, it's not in um, uh, slideshow view for us. It's in okay, the... That's, that's okay. I'll do the, start it from the beginning. Perfect. And then uh, just a second. Right, that's good. Okay, well, first of all, um, thank you, uh, Mike, and thank you to the board of CED for the, for the opportunity to, to share um, this presentation. Um, it has been a little challenging to do so because the subject of microhydro is very wide and um, we have, we may have some people here, in fact I, I know one or two who do have quite a lot of knowledge on microhydro and others of you may not. So let's see how we get on, um, use the chat facility as we go through. Uh, I'm now going to just quickly run through what I'm proposing to, to talk through. Um, I'll start with a, um, a short introduction and um, what the scope of the, the talk will be. Then we'll look at the process of how energy is converted from water into electricity. And then, so that will be the sort of theory. We won't go into it in very much, much detail, but I hope enough detail for you to understand the, the complete process at a basic level. And then we'll look at the process of actually going from, not from water, but from an idea to an operating scheme. In other words, the process of developing a scheme. And it's quite important to understand that because it's, it's, not, it's not that straightforward. Then we'll look at some common problems that could be eliminated with suitable foresight uh, at the design stage when you're specifying the scheme and arranging it. And a lot, uh, you know, uh, that's the time when mistakes can be made or good design can be put in place. And then finally, we'll just briefly look at the context from CED's point of view and the kind of schemes that we're currently involved with and some of their characteristics. And then as Mike has said, we'll hopefully have some time to feel some of the questions that anybody uh, may have. 
so it might just be useful for some of you to understand a little more about my background and my involvement in the world of hydro. Um, I've been involved with different types of hydro, mini hydro, micro hydro and pico hydro. And these photos that should come up will kind of, I hope, show what we're talking about. So the first photo is of a, um, a one kilowatt low head pico hydro turbine in Nepal. And you can see where the two boys are standing. They are standing on an irrigation channel or the side of it, the bank of an irrigation channel. And the, they keep the, the, the village Nepalis keep that irrigation channel open at times of the year when they need to supply water into the rice paddy. It's absolutely vital. And the rice paddy themselves, as, as any of you who visited Nepal will, will know, or other parts of South, South Asia, is in terraces down. So um, this little scheme, it's a one kilowatt output, and it was developed. I was, I was played a part in the development of the technology. We developed it in NHE where I was working. Um, but at the same time, the factory where I had been seconded to as a mission partner was supplying parts and equipment and fabrications to the 60 megawatt Kimpti One hydropower station. And what you're looking at there is obviously the power lines that take the power out. The building behind is not the powerhouse. The building behind is the offices. The powerhouse is in the mountain. It's a cavern actually about uh, 900 meters in uh, through a tunnel, through an adit in the mountain itself. So a completely different level of engineering. So as you can have gathered, as you gathered, I've worked in Nepal for eight and a half years as it happens as a mission partner um, involved with developing very small micro hydro, pico hydro in fact, schemes. Um, and then after that, we came to West Wales and I be, I worked for 12 and a half years for a consultancy called Delas, who some of you know. I know John Knight's on this call and he, John Knight also worked at Delas at some time in the past, so you can ask him about that. Um, and I was involved with what, what's traditionally, you know, might be called micro hydro schemes. This scheme here is a very interesting one from an engineering perspective, not just because of the hydro, but it's at Clisifran Reservoir in Pembrokeshire. And as some of you civil engineers will know, uh, Chlisifran is a concrete gravity dam that was, the construction was finished on it in about 1972. And it was always conceived as a multi-purpose scheme. In other words, the water was used for various purposes, not just, to, not just for a, um, a water treatment works, but also for industrial uh, factory use for cooling and also for environmental uses, um, for providing freshet releases, which are releases at certain times of the year for salmon and migrating fish that migrate on the, the Clydai River, which is uh, what this reservoir would feed down into. And then uh, fourthly, the reservoir is used for amenity, as a public amenity, and there's a countryside park there. So anyway, um, it's easy to get distracted, but um, we, this scheme here is a 250 kilowatt scheme uh, and I could, I could spend 45 minutes talking to you about that. Uh, so the scope of the, the talk, um, we will just be, just bear with me, I'm just going to get that out of the way. Um, Yes, so we're limiting this talk very much to micro hydro. So um, schemes of no more than one megawatt output. And we are also limiting it to schemes in parts of the world where CED is working. And as Mike has pointed out at the start, we're going to try and do some skills sharing um, as, as well as um, the other side of it. So sharing our knowledge and increasing our own level of understanding. So we'll see how, we'll see how that works out. 
So as, as many of you will know, um, CD has become more involved with various microhydro scheme developments since about 2018. And I have made a number of presentations, it's worth reminding you of. Some of you will have, so I know some of you here have, have listened to those presentations. Uh, there was one in 2019, which was a workshop in York, at the York get together. Um, and then in last year, I did a couple of presentations for the London Cell Group. Now, many of you won't be part of the London Cell Group, but those of you who are, um, may have seen one of two of the photos coming up. Uh, resources, I just put this in to say one or two of the figures I've taken are from a, um, a, a, an oldish but, but good publication um, by Harvey um, and uh, let's just see, um, uh, it's called the Micro Hydro Design Manual. Um, but I can advise if anybody is interested. I can um, I can I can advise on, on on a number of publications which explain various aspects of microhydro technology, um, and I'm very happy to do that. So now let's now move to the um, the, the first part, main part of the presentation, and it is that when we think about water, I mean we need to be really the question we're really asking is what is the resource. When we talk about microhydro, and clearly it's water. And the what we're trying to do is to change some of the potential energy that you can get by storing water um, in a pipeline. And the greater the head, basically the potential energy is, is proportional to the head. Um, you remember that the pressure down here, this is supposed to be the turbine, this is supposed to be the the forebay from where the water's fed, and it feeds down through the pipe. The pressure of the water as it enters the turbine or, or in the pipeline just before the turbine is um, rho gh, density of water times gravity times the head. So that's our resource um, and clearly um, that's, that's, we need to be able to measure what this, this head is. But actually the resource, there's, there's two sides to it. It's not just the pressure, but it's also the rate at which we can feed the water down the pipe and through the turbine. And the actual power we can generate is a product of the head and the flow rate. Now I'm going to come back to this, this picture um, later on. Um, but first, let's just point out a number of things that are pretty self-evident. Self um, but it, we, need, we need to assess the resource quite accurately. And therefore, we need to have, at some stage, a decent site survey where we can ideally find a suitable route for the pipeline, but also survey from the intake down to a, a potential turbine powerhouse site. So um, surveying is the first thing that's critical. We also need to do some sort of hydrology, hydrology assessment. And that's rather easier said than done because reliable gauged river flow data, which is what we want, is very often in the sort of places that CD works, it's not readily available. And coming back to this picture now, this, uh, you won't be able to read it, I don't suppose, but um, this yellow line is pointing to Kisizi Hospital. And this yellow line is pointing to the Rababo scheme um, proposed intake position. And this whole analysis, the analysis of this catchment area, was done using GIS software. And GIS software, I've discovered, and this is one of the things I want to share, 
is incredibly powerful. Um, it's incredibly powerful in that it can work out things like catchment areas for you very accurately. Um, and just to expand on that just a, a tiny, tiny bit, um, some of you will know or have heard of the GIS software called ArcGIS. And that's a commercial package. It's used, it's like the um, it's like the Microsoft version. It's used by all the big universities and, and research um, institutions. However, there is an, and you have to pay for that, you see, you have to pay a lot of money for that. There is another package, and there may be, indeed be several other packages, but there is another package called QGIS, and it is free to use. It is open software, but its, it's uh, capabilities are very, very similar to ArcGIS, I, I'm, I'm led to believe. And so I used QGIS together with um, digital elevation models that are available off the internet. And then I use QGIS to work out the catchment area. Now, why I mentioned this is not to not so much to say what I can do, but there, if, if CED is involved with water supply projects, um, say for drinking water or for, for other reasons, then it might be that there are others here who might find the use of QGIS quite a useful thing to to try out but again we could we could have several talks of 45 minutes on how to use the software I've spent quite a lot of time in the last three years um, learning how to use it and using it and I've had course to use it for the micro hydro scheme developments in Uganda that we've been looking at so that's something I could I could recommend and there may be other engineers who have more experience than I do in using it, but it's just a little flag to a useful tool that um, others might find comes in handy. So we, we assess our head, we assess our hydrology, and the hydrology is, is computed in terms of a hydrograph, but also the flow duration curve. Um, we then need to start doing an analysis of how much um, how much um, power we, re we really need. It's all very well to have a hydro resource and it's all very well to generate power, but who's going to use it? And how much of the power are they going to use? And that's quite a critical question because if you put in an enormous scheme, it's going to cost an enormous amount of money. If you, can't, if you only use, say, 10, 20% of that power, it's not necessarily a very good investment. Or, or use of resources. So we then have to marry the two things up in terms of designing the scheme and the size of it. How much power can we practically extract from our situation? Um, and how much and where can we use that, that power? What loads can we use it on? Um, obviously, some of the, the schemes that we're involved with in, in Uganda are hospitals. So the user of the power is the hospital. But even on, the, even on those schemes, the power can be used in different ways. And going hand in hand with the, the scheme sizing, we would do an energy study. And that's to look at these questions of how much of, the, how much of the energy are we going to use? If we can use a, a high percentage of it, then that's a good indication that it's a, a worthwhile scheme to, to do. Okay, well, this, although this, um, uh, the title of this slide is Water to Wire Energy Conversion, we've just touched really on the first, the first point, which is um, what's our basic resource? So now we're going to work our way through the energy conversion process. And we're going to start on the right-hand side of the diagram where it says power input. So the power input is the, the resource I was talking about, the theoretical power we can, we can get from the, the head and the flow. But of course, we have to channel the water out of the river and into a pipeline. And we could use a channel, often, often the intake might be in a fairly steeply sided um, ravine where it's um, difficult to put a pipe. So you might have a, a channel 
and the channel's at an angle and you're losing, you're losing some of your precious head, depending on how long that channel is. Um, it's often better to conceive the scheme so that you can take the pipeline right up to the intake. And of course, we're going to lose, we're going to lose some of our head in terms of um, losses in um, pipeline losses in the pipe itself as the water comes down. And we uh, quite a quite a quite a crucial aspect of of um, the design is the actual size of the pipe. The bigger we make the pipe, and the smoother we make the bore, the less we're going to lose, the less head we're going to lose from top to bottom. Bearing in mind that the pipeline could quite easily be a kilometer, two kilometers long. But of course, the bigger we make the pipe bearing in mind that the, you know, the area of a pipe is proportional to its diameter squared, there's going to be a lot more material and the pipe's going to be heavier, uh, much more expensive and potentially a little harder to, to put together. So we want to try and keep the pipeline small. So here is now the first, um, at the moment, the energy in the water is potential energy. It's in, stored in the form of pressure. Uh, now the first stage of the conversion is to convert that pressure energy into shaft power. And the device that does that, of course, is the turbine. And there's various types of, of turbine. There's two main types. There's uh, impulse turbines where the water is arranged to come out of a jet or a number of jets and impact on buckets. So this particular diagram is, is kind of showing a, 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 um, an impulse turbine. And the jet of water, where the energy is now being converted from pressure into velocity, it spins the turbine, it spins the rotor, um, and it turns the, uh, that energy um, into shaft power. And of course, the turbine itself will not be 100% efficient. And we're obviously looking for an efficient turbine. But we have to bear in mind that the turbine may not necessarily be running at the same flow all the time. In fact, it will run at a variety of flows from the design flow. And in the dry season, it might be running down to as low as 10% of the design flow. So you're trying to maintain efficiency at different flows. That's a whole ball game. And again, I could talk to you about that for hours. But we've now converted our power into shaft power. It's now mechanical power. And although this diagram is showing various steps that take it through to electricity that we can use in, the, in our homes, uh, the shaft power itself is useful. And of course, in mills, you might use the shaft power. Um, I'm just going to mute myself while the clock chimes. Just bear with me. Clock has, the clock has stopped. I do apologise. I should have thought to <laughs> have removed the clock from the room. Um, but yes, the shaft power, we could connect a belt uh, to, the output or, or to the output shaft and we could run a mill. And this has been done a lot, not just in our own country historically, but in India and in all parts of the world, um, mechanical power is used. But anyway, we have a turbine and we have shaft power and this diagram simplifies it dramatically to just having a direct drive to the generator where we're going to convert the shaft power into electricity. Because this makes the assumption that the turbine runs at the same speed as the generator. Now, this is something we as, as, as engineers scheme, scheming up a, a site, we try and arrange for that to be the case. But very often there will be a some kind of mechanical transmission between the, sh the, the turbine shaft and the generator shaft. So a belt drive, a gearbox, those are the, the, the two main uh, options that you have. Both of which add expense and they themselves have a certain efficiency. So we would, as soon as you have a belt drive, you're going to lose two or three percent of your shaft power. Uh, so you obviously want to avoid that if you can. Similarly with a gearbox. You can get some very efficient um, uh, belts, 
flat belts is what I would use um, given the choice. They can be sort of 90, well, 98% efficient. Um, but anyway, what we what we're trying to do is now to convert the mechanical shaft power into electricity, and we would use a, a generator to do that. And we have two main choices: a synchronous generator or an asynchronous generator. Um, an asynchronous generator is another name for a squirrel cage motor in reverse. Um, uh, and again, generators are there's a whole science behind them. We could, we could talk about generators for, for days. <laughs> um, but let's just say that um, the generator efficiently, and they are at larger sizes, they're much more, uh, you, you, wouldn't, you would expect a loss of 5% in a generator, not 15, for a, a microhydro scheme of anything more than about 100, 100 kilowatts. Um, they, they, they are very efficient. And, and modern generators that are used on permanent magnet generators, they are very, very much 95%, 96% efficient. Um, so our generator typically for microhydro will be generating three phase 400 volts line to line. Um, but our users, our load, aren't necessarily going to be down by the powerhouse because the powerhouse has got to return the water that's passed through the turbine back into the river. Our village might be up on a hill or our hospital might be some kilometers away, distant from the powerhouse. And so we have to take the power down to the load center or load centers. And it would be inefficient to do so at 400 volts. Uh, so we need to transform the voltage up to 11,000 volts, perhaps 30, 33,000 volts are two common um, transmission voltages or six, well, 1,000 volts is another, is an, is another standard uh, transmission. And this is saying transmission losses of 10%. Well, if you were losing 10% on the transmission, you would have undersized your conductors, I think. Um, you generally aim to minimize your, your, your losses. Um, because of course all these losses are adding up um, so our, our, our input power to what we actually end up with we might this is going to end up very low if we don't take care in designing all the elements in the conversion process and this is very much the job of the engineers plural involved with the scheme because we need electrical engineers to make and transmit high voltage engineers to make sure that these cables are properly sized so that the, the loss is not one, 10%, but maybe 1% or even less. We need uh, hydraulic engineers to make sure the losses in the penstock are, well, I would say no more than 5%. I generally aim for about 5% loss from the intake to the, to the turbine. And the mechanical engineer needs to arrange for a direct drive and arrange for a suitable turbine to be used that really can produce power as, as efficiently as possible. Um, industrial scale turbines, the efficiencies are well over 90%. Um, so you would be losing, you would be losing 20%, you might be losing eight, seven, eight, nine percent only. So that's the process. And some words to go with it. What we start at at the input um, is the is the head multiplied by the flow rate as I said before, and you have to multiply it through by the the density of the of the fluid or the liquid, which in this case is river water, and gravity, and use an appropriate value of gravity. Um, if you're in Uganda or on the equator, I I use a frig of nine point seven eight, not nine point eight one or not nine point eight. Um, so that's just a little, um, a little thing, maybe not, not the most important. So just before we now move on to the process, um, I, I, I know we've just gone very quickly over the conversion process, um, but I hope you found that useful and, and also realise the main, one of the main points to realise is, is that Certainly for larger schemes, you need engineers with different skills. 
um, it's unusual for one engineer to have all the skills to develop the whole scheme. The other thing I forgot to, to mention was, was that what was not shown on that diagram is how you can control the whole thing. It, it completely missed the, um, uh, the, uh, the fact that um, you, 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 you need a control system. It also didn't show any valves, either electrical or hydraulic. Um, and it didn't show how you would actuate the turbine, how you would actually change the flow passing through the turbine. You need some kind of actuator to actually adjust the flow to suit the, the load. And that could be done hydraulically, it could be done pneumatically, but that would be very unusual, or it could be done using electric actuators, which would be quite common in, in the UK. So I've I blithely not talked about any of the technology involved with that, or particularly the control system. Um, but on the control system, I think the only thing perhaps to appreciate is that there's two main types of control system. You can have a control system that um, controls the load um, that, the, that the turbine um, puts out. So it runs at a fixed load, and if the, the load user turns their lights off or turns their lights on, all that the controller does is it, it, it puts the balance of load that it's producing to, it, it sends the, the, the balance of the power to a ballast load. So the turbine's always producing the same amount of power, and the control system is just varying how much, um, how much power is wasted, if you like, or sent to, sent to the ballast. Or you can control the other main class of control system is where you control to flow. So as the load fluctuates, so you adjust the amount of water passing through the turbine. And you're at the, by doing that, you're adjusting the output to match the load. Now then, let's move on to the next, um, the next uh, section. And this is how do you develop a scheme? How do you go from the idea? Now, I've put the word idea, but that encapsulates a whole range of things because the, there needs to be, there needs to be a need for power and that needs to be realized. And there will be other ways of providing for power potentially. It could be from the national grid but the national grid may not be in the, may not have extended to the location where the need is felt. And there may be other resources that could be used, maybe solar, PV solar or wind turbines. The bulk standard, um, situ you know, bulk standard situation would be a diesel generator in a remote region providing a hospital or a school or an institution or a workshop. And clearly a diesel run power source, whilst it's, it's a wonderful way of getting power, you have a fossil fuel that you're using and you have environmental pollution to deal with as well. So the development phase, basically there is always a development phase and by development phase we're talking about doing some of those studies that I touched upon earlier, feasibility studies, technical. And there's really three strands to development and I've, I've listed them with those three subtitles. There's the engineering and technical considerations. Then there are the consenting and development considerations and by that we mean getting permission to build the scheme in the first place diverting water out of the river and then returning that water to the river but maybe one two kilometers downstream means that there's effectively a depleted reach a region of the river that will not see as much water as it would normally and any aquatic and um, other environmental 
um, you know, birds and other, other fauna, flora, could be affected by that. And so we, you would need almost anywhere, and this certainly applies in Uganda and in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, you would need a license. And you will not be permitted a license until you can demonstrate what the changes in the, uh, or the environmental impact actually is. Uh, there may be landowner agreements that need to be put in place. There may be, you would need um, a permit to generate from the government. Um, there will be potentially other, depending on the situation, other permits that are needed. And all of those take time to obtain. Uh, as we have been finding out with the schemes that CED is involved with. Now the third strand is the financing and it's the to do with the economic viability of the of the scheme. Somehow the schemes have got to be funded and financing needs to be put in place um, and there's two ways really of funding. One is from uh, equity funding and the other is debt funding. So equity funding would be parties providing the money in order to take a stake in, in the ownership of the scheme. Whereas debt funding is basically borrowing money from a bank or a specialist lender and that money has to be paid back. Uh, of course grant funding is possible also um, but Yes, and some schemes have been funded through grant funding. But again, all of that takes time to do. And if there's any debt funding, in other words, funding for, that's from a, borrowed from a bank, the lender is going to want assurance that they're going to get their money back. And so studies have to be done and they have to be done to a certain standard. And that all takes time. So we have technical, we have consenting, and we have finance. And that is why I have put development phase two years plus. Um, and some schemes, I've been involved with schemes where the development phase has taken the best part of 10 years. Uh, so um, all, all sorts of problems can occur. And that is the reason why some of the CED projects we're working on it may seem to some of you that they've been going on forever and there doesn't seem to be any pro progress. And there has been progress, but we're still in this development phase. The next phase of a development, having had the idea and mobilized um, various parties um, and gone through the development phase, got the consents, got an outline design, is to build and construct the scheme. So we have the design and build phase. And this is, this is the phase that many engineers are very, very familiar with, whether it's on bridges or dams or on uh, whatever it might be. Uh, engineering procurement construction. For the microhydro schemes that we're involved with, uh, they shouldn't take more than about 18 months. Um, all the hard work is in the development. Um, this is where the engineers can really crack on and uh, get the work tendered out um, and get a good program manager. And a lot of these, some of these jobs would be done by our partners. They wouldn't be done by CED at all. Um, but we might be there just as a client's engineer to support. And uh, you have the engineering, you have the contract tendering, procurement of goods and services. That, as we all know, is absolutely key. Controlling the costs and then the construction project can start. Um, but the construction is one thing. The most critical, in my experience, the most critical stage of the scheme is the commissioning. Because it's at the commissioning where all those different elements, mechanical, the hydraulics of the turbine, the control system, all the wiring, all the instrumentation, all the uh, all of that comes together, and those that commissioning engineer 
and those involved with the commissioning, it is, it is, it is the most critical time to get everything working properly. And in fact, the first, very often, the first six months of operation, maintenance, the actual operation phase, the commissioning is still ongoing in the form of troubleshooting, in the form of um, optimizing certain settings so that everything works nicely. So the commissioning, is, it's very rare that you the sort of the commissioning ends and then it just suddenly goes into operation um, because uh, you've got to think about the operators, they need to be trained up um, so commissioning, a part of the commissioning is all the documentation, uh, operator training, commissioning documents, um, planned maintenance schedules, doing all of that. It all needs to be done and it all needs to be done as carefully and as possible. Um, so that's, that's the process. But once you go into operation, well, how long is operation going to go on for? I've written here for generations and I'm going to illustrate that I think in one or two slides time. So um, that is that again, this is all very, um, very much uh, simplified, but those are the three phases and it's very helpful to try and identify exactly where you are within each, each phase. Um, and then, you know, uh, the, the word that's used when the financing is all in place is, what's it called? Financial close. So when you get to financial close, it means the money is ready to be spent and you can go on to this phase. And the end of this phase is when the commissioning documents have been issued and you've trained the operators and they, and the, the, then you can go into, into, into scheduled operation. Right, well, this section I hope may be of interest. Um, I'm limiting this to some problems that I have seen in the last three years. Because if we were to go through all of the common problems with microhydro, we'd be here all night. So um, just bear in mind, I've just selected four or five problems that I've literally seen in the last three years. Uh, and I think they are, there's, there's much we can learn from them. And uh, we'll illustrate each of them with a with an actual example or two, um, but I'll just list what they are now. So the, the first common problem is that um, the, the, the people involved with um, conceiving and specifying the scheme have not, also, not adequately provisioned for inspection and maintenance of the pipeline itself. And we're going to look at an example from, K from Kuluva Hospital in a minute to, to demonstrate that. Often, it's people have not thought through carefully enough uh, or designed in adequate provisions for operation and maintenance of the plant. And we're going to look at an example. Um, in fact, every scheme I've seen in, in East Africa in the last three years, they've all suffered from the same issue, which is not to have a flow meter specified. And so we're going to look at some examples of why you should have a flow meter and how it's, how it's so useful. Often there isn't sufficient planning for the long term. And we, by this, I'm, I'm meaning planning for the grid. We talked earlier about, earlier about the fact that probably most schemes that are started are started because the grid isn't there in that, in that remote place. And there's a need for power. Um, and there's this idea that you're off grid and that the grid will never come but the grid does come and so we'll look at that and sometimes when the scheme is designed the the three steps of the process that were in the last slide the development the, um, the consenting the construction and the operation all work really well they'll all be done properly but if there isn't the governance of that asset it can lead to problems. So we will look at that again, looking at Kuluva Hospital. Uh, and on all of these, I'll, I'll, I'll only look very briefly at them. And another very, very common problem is that the conditions at the intake are often underestimated. The severity of flooding, 
the severity of landslides. And so we'll, we'll look at that. This is really a very, very important one, item five. So let's now go to this first one, which is not adequately providing for inspecting and maintaining the pipeline. So this is the pipeline at Kuluva Hospital. Some of you may have seen this photo or have seen similar. And the problem is, is that there's some blockages in it somewhere. And this photo is showing an invert in the pipe. So the water flows from right to left. But as you can see, it's not actually going downhill. It's coming down the hill this side. And then it's going back up the hill this side. And then, of course, it goes down again. But that's what we mean by an invert, um, a section of the pipe where it's going down and then it goes up and then it goes down again. And the engineer has carefully provided a flushing point, um, which in fact has seized at the moment, but um, never, nevertheless, that could, be, that could be sorted out. But I suspect that in this area, a lot of sand has consolidated on the bore of the pipe and it is causing a restriction. And it may be happening at other, there may be other sorts of deposits on the, on the pipe at other places. There may be other reasons for the blockage that we can't see. We can't see because we can't inspect inside. Because if we were to inspect inside this pipe, how would we do it? We'd have to, it's a welded pipe. Actually, there's not many flanges. Um, the length of the welded sections are well over 10 metres, 20, 30 metres, some of them. Uh, there's very infrequent flanges. If there was another flange here, say a couple of meters up with a, with, a, with a flanged adapter, we could remove this section and then we could inspect within the pipeline. But there is no such facility. So it's going to be quite a, a it's more going to be more of an operation to um, inspect and clean this pipeline. I have to balance this by saying that this pipeline has been in service for 25 years. And I believe this, I, I don't know, but I suspect this will be one of the few times it will have been cleaned. And um, inspecting in this pipe, this is from Kuluva Hospital, is part of the, the, um, the, the remediation works that's needed, um, as, well as, as well as repairing or replacing part of the turbine to get it back into the state where it can produce the power that it should be. So, um, you know, there are, of course, ways we could inspect this. We could, we could put um, a, a camera down on a, uh, you know, a robotically driven camera on wheels. You put it in at the intake and it runs all the way down taking photos. And I've, I've done several pipeline inspections in the UK for Welsh Water on that basis. But can we find a service provider in Uganda, for example, who could do the same? Now it's quite large pipe. I think it's for 400 or 450 um, bore. It's quite quite big and it's quite heavy. Um, so um, one of the provisions that we could make, and that with some foresight might be made, is to provide what's called a pigging trap at the intake, and allow for this pipeline to be pigged, which is a process very common in the sort of oil industry. Um, but it's also very, very common in the hydro industry in the UK and in other parts of the world. But um, it may not be so um, well understood or there be service providers in places like Uganda at the moment. Um, but ideally, I'd like to pick this whole pipe. But in fact, what we'll have to do, I think, is remove some of the sections at the places we suspect most of there being consolidated material on the bore and have a look and see and hopefully we'll get to the right place first time. So what's the second point? Not thinking through and designing inadequate provisions for operation and maintenance of the plant. Now we're, the, the example we're using here is of flow meters. And um, what I want to show you is, is the Unilever sites um, in, in Caricho, near Caricho, in Kenya. And absolutely none of these 
have a flow meter. Now, I don't know how clear this 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 um, uh, this figure is, but um, what it's showing is a series of dams uh, that run through what were originally six or seven separate T estates. They're now all owned by Unilever uh, Trading Kenya, and Unilever Unilever Kenya Trading. Um, employ tens of thousands of people picking tea and um, processing the tea leaves. And this is showing you various micro hydro assets that they've got. And they're, they're harnessing the power from each of the dams, which is a very sensible thing to do. You may not be able to read it, but this scheme here, it's a 90 kilowatt scheme, and it was built in 1928. Uh, and it still produces power. And this scheme here, 1932, 420 kilowatt. And then there's some more recent ones, quite large schemes. This is 1,600 kilowatts, so 1.6 megawatts. And they've got, um, and you can see the pipeline and the little powerhouse at the bottom. Uh, on this one, um, 740 kilowatts. That's from 1928. And then the second unit went in in 1949. So they're saying here that they've got the capacity to generate 2.85 megawatts through these nine different uh, units that they've got in these different powerhouses. Uh, now, I took Edwin to see these um, on one of my visits to Uganda. Edwin Wasinja, who's just got married. Uh, Edwin is the civil engineer at Kagando, um, a delightful young guy who I've got to know quite well. And I deliberately took him and we went with another friend of mine from school days, uh, Norman Chobe, and we, we went and we got ourselves an invite to have a look around these um, sites. To get back to the point, which I'm drifting from very quickly, none of them have a flow meter. Now, why is that an issue? Well, it's an issue for three reasons. The first reason is that when an engine, when there's problems with power not being what it should be, the engineer, first thing he wants to do is measure flow. And if there's no flow meter, it becomes awkward because he has to, he or she has to work out some other way of measuring the flow. And we will come on to that in a second. Um, but there is a growing and, and, and arguably more important reason why um, flow should be um, measured. And that is because, and um, Unilever Trade in Kenya um, confirmed this, they have their environmental um, regulator visits them every year and asks to see how much water they're using. And if we go back to this, the resource we're using, we're not using diesel, we're not using petrol, we're using water. We're not, I say using, I mean, we're not actually using it. It passes through the turbine and goes back in to the river. Uh, minus the depleted reach, which, as we've, we've noted, could be quite significant. Um, but nonetheless, the environmental agencies want to know how much you're using. And Unilever Trading Kenya are spending a lot of money on um, compensation, environmental compensation in the Kericho area. They're planting trees, lots of trees they're planting. Um, but um, the operator of the hydro scheme really ought to know how much water they're consuming and making sure that the amount of water that their turbine is using is within what they are licensed to be using because when turbines get inefficient they need more water to produce the same amount of power and if you've been licensed to take you know a certain amount of power 100 liters per second and you're using 110 120 you are using more than you've been allowed to use. And we as Christian engineers in development need to be very careful to make sure that we respect the environment and the, the environmental um, requirements that are laid down within the projects that we work on, whether it's hydro, micro hydro, water supply, drinking water, whatever. And so these are the reasons why they should have a flow meter. Each and every one and we're now going to move on to just showing you why you know, it's not a hard thing to do. So this is um, 
a typical water industry site. It's a little hydro scheme, Clubinon, 100 kilowatt scheme. I designed this scheme. Uh, and pipeline comes in, and the white, um, the white bit of pipeline, that's a Siemens flow meter, mag flow meter, very, very accurate. All you need is a bit of straight pipe. It's non-invasive, so it's not as if it restricts the flow. Um, so for this sort of application, you, you know, a mag flow is ideal, but expensive. Uh, second choice would be a um, ultrasonic flow meter, which is a strap-on device. It also doesn't um, impede the flow, and they're also very accurate. Um, so this is what I'm talking about, a strap-on flow meter. It can be done retrospectively, provided you've got a straight bit of pipe. And the, the length of straight pipe upstream and downstream is quite critical, but not excessive. So it's Kuluvar I wanted to talk about, and some of you will have seen the photos um, coming up, but there isn't room for, to retrofit a strap on flow meter. Because in this photo, this is the bank, the powerhouse is on the right, this is the powerhouse, and the pipe is in that block. So the pipe is buried, it comes through this hill, it comes in to the powerhouse. So I knew this was going to be the problem because I saw this photo before I got to the site. How are we going to measure the flow? Because I needed to measure the flow because the power at Kuluvar, when I visited in February last year, this was one of the problems. And this is what we had to do. We had to make our own flow meter. And we essentially designed a British Standard compliant broad crested weir, which is what this is here. And um, you can see that it does, uh, it's, this upstream bend is, uh, is not ideal. I would have we really, to comply 100%, 100%, we would have needed the, the channel to be straight further upstream. But the actual dimensions of the, uh, the box um, which this, this black um, DPM is covering, it, it, it all complies with the standard. And therefore, we can use the flow characteristics of the broad crested weir, British standard, whatever the number is. And you measure the height of the water above the crest of the box, or the crest of the weir, and from that height, you can then, from the rating curve, you can see what the flow is passing over it. And bear in mind, this flow has just come out of the turbine, which is um, from the powerhouse. So um, it's a, a fairly old fashioned way of doing it, but it's a pretty good way of doing it if you've got the time to put it all in. And Collins, who's one of the, um, the operators there, was very, very helpful. Uh, Collins and um, uh, a couple of other guys, Patrick, um, they, were, they were exceedingly helpful with, with very, very limited equipment to get this to get this uh, manufactured and fitted whilst I was there and I've titled this one a temporary flow measurement using a broad crested rear at Kuluva hospital it's only a temporary device um, but it would just have been so much easier um, if there had been a strap a place just to put a strap on flow meter or indeed is if if they had had a, a permanent fixture of a flow meter they would have found out that they were low on power many years ago it wouldn't have needed cd to come and um you know show them that uh, so those are the reasons why it's important to think about your instrumentation and to think longer term because even in kuluva hospital they also confirmed that the ugandan nema n-e-m-a which is the um environmental regulator is starting to come around and saying that they want to see how much water they're using now, when this scheme was put in, it's quite possible it was put in without an abstraction license because it was put in in 1995. And it's quite possible that the, um, the regulatory authority wasn't in a position to insist on them having a, a license here. Um, but this is, um, it's an important, it's a quite an important thing. Uh, and indeed for appropriate um, uh, instrumentation um, you know, sometimes instrumentation is, is cut off. The reason why instrumentation is not put in is to save money. And um, you can imagine that putting in a flow meter, it requires some thought, but there's also a cost attached. 
and and those are those are reasons why it often gets um, left off, as indeed do other parts of other other instrumentation, which would be quite useful. So always think about your instrumentation. Think think longer term. Think about um, what you what you really need. The next problem uh, is about um, the fact that sooner or later the national grid is likely to to um, to, to to reach the site, and this is a you know. I, I, you, this problem has occurred at Kisizi Hospital, Gagando Hospital, which is where this photo is, and at Kuluva Hospital. <laughs> in all cases, when they put the hydro scheme on, uh, the grid wasn't there. There was no grid. Uh, and in all three cases, here we are, you can see the grid supply. Now, I know Paul Darrell is on this phone, so um, he, 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 um, he's very familiar. He's walked this line. He knows, he knows every inch of it. But the hospital compound is just behind this vent, this hedging here and the I think I'm right in saying this line here is the grid and that box there there's a little green box there's that's a meter the 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 supply meter is there so the power comes down the line into the meter and then it goes through and into the hospital the meter is very important of course because that is a charging you have to pay for the power if it comes from the grid you don't get it for free but um, whilst Kagando is taking hospital from the grid, because they don't currently have a micro hydro scheme, Kuluvar Hospital has, is just working on its um, micro hydro power. And whilst the grid comes to the hospital, they refuse to use it. They refuse to use it because they have to pay for it. And this is, that's, this is another thing I, I'll come on to in a, in, in a bit. But, why it's I think it's important to realize that with microhydro and unless it's there, there may be cases where this doesn't apply but the national grid will probably come to the town or the village or the area at some point and um, it would be good to bear that in mind in designing the control system because and also in terms of getting the consents because if a consent could be obtained, and, and this is, I'm pushing the boundaries here, but if a consent could be obtained for the government to generate power from a micro hydro scheme and export it onto the grid when the grid eventually arrives, it would solve many, many problems. And it would be very advantageous for, in this case, it's Kugando Hospital. Um, we're having to go through the process with the ERA, the Electricity Regulation Authority, to see whether we, the hydro scheme that we plan to put in, whether it can export onto this, this grid. Um, but there are complications with that. I've already kind of touched upon governance, um, but clearly poor governance can lead to unfocused management. For example, the priority could be on the hospital or other institution. I'm thinking here of Kuluva Hospital, where they've had the scheme for 25 years and the management has been unfocused. Um, they've had to concentrate on the hospital at the expense of the hydro scheme. And the reason is partly this, is that the management has not made enough effort to collect the income that is owed. In the case of hospital, the staff should pay for the power, should pay some 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 money for the power that they consume. Um, if you don't collect that income, then how do you maintain the scheme? And if you don't have the income, you don't have the investment uh, or the finances to uh, or for financial reserve to invest in keeping the scheme going. And you may have a lack of strategy for the long term, for example, connecting to the grid and exporting power or upgrading the assets that you have in five ten years time so the option we're looking at at Kuluva is to set get them to set up a single purpose vehicle in other words a company um, with a skilled and motivated board now this is happening apparently the company has been registered and I hope that they will have people from hospital, from the diocese, because this is a Church of Uganda owned um, hospital, 
from the diocese and other relevant experts so that they can really take the Kuluva scheme forward. But the same thing applies at Kisizi and at Kagando and uh, to other, other microhydra schemes. And uh, I'm not sure this is the best way to do it, but this is certainly one way that it's being done and it has many advantages to have a registered company that is, that is um, owning the asset, owning the microhydra scheme and, and motivated to operate it sustainably. And so we come to the last one now. Apologies to um, uh, attend attendees who are part of the London cell group, but these are these are the same slides. Um, civil works must be designed with the worst case of flood flows in mind. It must be strong enough to resist damage from rocks in transit in the water in flood. Um, arranged ideally so that the rocks don't, rocks don't get trapped at the intake or at least are fairly easy to move out after. Um, and with suitable features for trapping sand and sediment and to, to flush out the sand and the sediment that you trap in order to stop that sand and sediment working its way down the pipeline and into the turbine. Um, you, if you remember back to the slide I showed you with the, uh, the energy conversion process, um, water continuously coming down that pipe if there's sand in that water and if the pressure at the bottom of the pipe is very high then the velocity of the water coming out of the nozzle or the spear valve and impacting on that rotor um, it's going to cause considerable damage mechanical abrasion damage to the to the turbine runner um, so we have to avoid we have to avoid that at all costs Obviously, there will be quite a lot of vegetable matter that will come down um, water courses, and there will also be human matter, human waste, quite often, of, of all kinds, bags, plastic bags, and, and, and so on. So we have a challenge. Now, um, I'll just quickly go through these. Um, so this is the current structure at um, the proposed intake for the Ruembia scheme. So this is for Kagando Hospital, and they were taking taken in October 2018 and the structure there was conceived very much just for measuring purposes this isn't how it will look for water abstraction but um, it's really for measuring flow and this was done before CED was involved I, I should say um, and it's showing kind of normal typical flows it all looks fairly um, well ordered um, can't see any rocks coming down the stream there we can't you know everything's fine um, it's not during flood and um, it was constructed before CD was involved so that's all great so um, these photos are now taken in June 2020 after flooding in May 2020 and so this first shot is, is showing and this is this is actually isn't the flood flows um, it just happened to be I would call this high flows I suspect the peak flood flows that the water would have been going um, you know out of the top of this photo um, because the the really high flood flows their duration is always is always very short it's just a matter of hours rather than days and you might have a series of peaks separated by you know, two or three days if there's a you know a, a week or two weeks of, of very wet weather uh, and this caused civil works damage so this is later later on and you can see the reinforced um, concrete is damaged this would be a few days later or a week or two later and you can see some rocks are trapped behind the weir um, and you can perhaps see better. Um, this is during the cleanup process, and some of the rocks were being um, removed from the um, from the pond, uh, the weir pond, as it were. So, one of the issues. This is really a civil engineering issue. The um, the concrete was not properly specified, uh, as I understand it. Um, it was mixed by hand. It wasn't a 
a sort of a guaranteed grade, a C35, for example, it, it probably, well, it, it certainly wasn't that. Uh, so that was an issue. Um, a related issue with, with, with heavy rain, of course, is landslides, uh, which is a particular issue for us on, um, at uh, for the Ruembia scheme because the ground is so steep. So we're going to need to go exceedingly careful, uh, carefully with our, our designs and our route for the penstock pipe. Um, and this scheme here, this photo is from a scheme called Mubuku 1. It's on the slopes of the Ruinzori Mountains, just as the Ruembia scheme is, but just further around on the east side. It's a 13 megawatt scheme. It's quite a, uh, it's been around since the 1950s or 1960s, I suppose. And this was taken again in May uh, 2020, just after the floods. And look, it's full of sand. Well, that's great. That's what it should be. It should be full of sand because we don't want the sand going on down the canal to the forebay and into the turbine. The problem is we can't run the turbine now until we've got all rid of all that silt. And there's no flushing facility other than getting some folks in there uh, with shovels by the looks of things and, um, you know, remove it manually. So we need to think ahead. We need to think about how are we going to trap the sand? And this is a, a fairly standard um, uh, settling basin that, that traps sand. But not just how we're going to trap it, how are we going to remove it? And ideally, we would be able to move it automatically, not manually. And even better still, we'd be able to remove it whilst keeping the turbine running. And to do that, we would have to trap the sand in such a way that it couldn't carry on uh, and uh, into the pipeline. Uh, and I, I showed this, um, uh, let's get down to the figure, I showed this um, slotted pipe sediment sluicer uh, and they're, they're gaining great popularity. Developed in Nepal actually, about the time I was working in Nepal at one of the UMN sites um, by a Norwegian um, guy called Tom Jacobson. Uh, and I, I don't have time, I've probably overrun my time, but um, just to say that this device is able to, has been proved to allow you to flush your, your desanding chamber uh, automatically, um, in a supervised way, of course, um, whilst maintaining operation of the plant. Uh, and um, so um, this is this is this is what we're going to try and work on using for um, the the Ruembia scheme. Um, now then, let's see. We are. I'm coming to the end of the presentation, and I will, if you'll forgive me, I'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, I, I just wanted to end by thinking about the context within which CED is operating in the, the countries that we work in, in, you know, in, in, uh, in Africa, Africa and in Pakistan and so on. Um, and, you know, this kind of goes without saying, but it's worth reminding ourselves of the global, of climate change um, and global warming, um, environmental pollution and renewable energy being useful because of course we are not generating co2 anything like we would do with a you know using a diesel generator for example um but we, and we can do so in a sustainable way um so that's uh, a very good feature as, as i pointed out we're not actually using the water well we're using it but we're not it doesn't disappear it's, it's staying in the river um, it, it, we do have to worry about the depleted reach, but it's it's pretty sustainable, um, given that the flows that you generally take tend to be a fairly low proportion of what's coming down the river. Um, so um, renewable energy does fit, and and um, this is this is obviously something that galvanises 
some of our clients to be wanting to use their hydro, you know, resource on their doorstep. Um, but the places we kind of work in um, are, are also developing in different ways, and, and particularly in terms of infrastructure. And we've we've we, we've we've covered off, I think, rural electrification. So national grids are expanding, um, certainly in Uganda, and I would suspect right through East Africa. Um, and so we've talked about the implication of that to a micro hydro scheme that might originally when it was built being in a very rural place, but but actually 10 years later being a, a center where there's roads coming through and there's um, power coming to as well. And strengthening regulatory structures is a good thing actually. Um, and that means that we have to deal with um, government organizations to get the permissions in order to do the scheme rather than just doing whatever we want it shows a country's maturity and um, i've noticed that the regulatory structure is getting more organized in uganda for example um, and it's not something we should complain about i think it's something we should work with and encourage um, for example by making sure that the proper environmental and social impact assessments are done um, because that forms a, um, a baseline um, which is very useful for other purposes than perhaps originally intended and of course economic considerations come in and uh, really under the side where i've put fast population growth and urbanization this is certainly happening around the ruinzori foothills uh, so there is competition for water, for example, and of course, with urbanisation comes the, the the growing need for power. So whilst the grid comes and the grid can provide power, I think there's very much still a role for providing uh, micro hydro power, particularly if it can be grid connected, because that helps to stabilise a grid, particularly the ends of a grid, as it were. If you see what I mean, a spur, the end of a long spur out. Um, having generation at the end of a spur um, uh, generation uh, or a transmission line is, is has various engineering benefits and it can also pr uh, promote enterprise development if you've got the power maybe you could use it for a um, coffee factory or for a mill a maize mill um, or for a workshop so all of those become possibilities and I see I've come to the end of the presentation. So I'm going to, if I can, um, I'm going to come back um, to Zoom. work out how to do it I'm going to hand back to Mike it's usually at the top of the screen to unshare yeah it's not coming up on mine for some reason no hold on um I can stop you sharing I think yes I, I think if you stop me sharing yeah. there we are. I've um, taken away your permission John well, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, it's just really good to see the full spread uh, and to see the context as well. So we, we are running a bit over time, but um, feel free to uh, ask your, uh, any questions that uh, you have. Just unmute yourself. We haven't got any um, uh, questions so far through the chat. There have been a few comments about why Unilever might have chosen not to put flow meters or might be choosing not to do that at the moment. I have to be a little bit careful because my son works for them. So, <laughs> but I will be talking to him about it afterwards. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Just a comment. Um, Jono, 
thanks for a great presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Just a comment on the use of the water from the hydro scheme, as we talked about before, to note that because you've already taken the water in through a, a weir and put it through settlement basins, etc., that water is of reasonably good quality in terms of debris and such like to possibly be used for water supply or the, at least the raw water for a water supply scheme um, as another use um, where it's appropriate or where you can achieve it really. Yes, thank you for, for that, Nigel. Um, so what, what um, Nigel knows the Kagando scheme well because the hospital also has a, a problem with water supply because of urbanisation around uh, the area uh, and we in CEDR through Nigel um, are looking at helping with that and one of the possibilities was to use the water coming out of the turbine as an intake point for gravity, a, a gravity supply system down to the hospital because the hospital is about four kilometres away from the powerhouse. Um, one thing we've found is, is that even up at the intake, I, I mentioned earlier um, human waste needing to be screened, uh, or human generated waste, and by that I meant of course plastic bags and things, but the, some villagers also use the river as a toilet, uh, so levels of E. coli are very high, or relatively high, um, so uh, those are all considerations that need to be looked at. What would you consider the smallest uh, sort of scheme to be? I know that you've worked on hospitals uh, and the like, which are relatively large schemes, but smaller hamlets, do you think that they could also be served? Or do you think that it would be better to go solar for them? You, if you might remember the, the photo I put up introducing myself, uh, Robert, um, showing the one kilowatt scheme. That, that one kilowatt scheme provides 22 houses, each with three compact fluorescent lamps, of which is typically would put one outside where the animals are and just have two inside. Um, and many parts of Nepal are very, very rural. And um, the grid may, may eventually come, but it will take a long, long time because Nepal is so hilly and parts of it are so remote. Um, so um, that technology, one kilowatt, can do it because it's light enough, it's simple enough to operate, it's cheap enough for it to be used um, in very remote places. It can come in on a porter's back or several porter's backs. It could come in on an aeroplane to a provincial center and then be ported to wherever it's needed for a village. So one of my joys was, um, just hold on. <laughs> one of the joys of um, that project was, was putting those demonstration projects out. Um, very, we were particularly aimed at very remote rural, rural communities to use the resource they had, which was the Kulo, which has those, those irrigation channels that supply their irrigation paddy fields. They're sure to keep that working, that, that, that you know, keeping water coming down, that they need it for their very livelihoods. So to be able to engineer a, a very modest one kilowatt scheme to supply their village was a very, very good fit. So yes, you can go down, but the general rule is um, a lot of the engineering problems don't simplify down with size and so the bigger you get generally you get better economies of scale but um, there are ways to do it and i'm very willing to tell you more about the pico hydro i was going to ask john though um whether um the flows in that nepali situation are year round or are they seasonal uh very good question um the the, the in, in Nepal are, are highly seasonal. Um, Nepal um, weather is characterised like all of South Asia or in, uh, the, the Indian subcontinent 
um, as being, you have the monsoon. So from, uh, when does it start? Uh, end of June, the monsoon starts and then it just rains <laughs> solidly all the time, it feels like, for three months. And then it ends about sort of mid-September, end of September. And then the weather's absolutely beautiful. Um, so um, the rice paddy is, is planted out. But from, an, from a, a hydro point of view, it's, it's, it's less than ideal because um, you have all the water, but not for that long. Um, there is a shorter range. You do get some rains around... Um, after Christmas occasionally in, in certain places and of course some of the rivers are glacier fed or what's left of the glaciers um, but the, with the Pico Hydro they take very relatively small amounts of water and you can use that water again in paddy fields lower down so um, the main rivers don't certainly don't dry up um, but the flows the flow in a typical water, main water course can be a thousand times what it is normally in during a monsoon. That's the sort of difference in flow, rough, as a, just a kind of a rough figure of order of size. A thousand times as much water comes down in a monsoon flood than in, you know, in normal times. Thank you. I think I interrupted somebody who was about to ask a question. Well, just a comment that if they replaced the compact fluorescent lights, which are a pollution hazard because not only do they have very thin glass but they also have phosphorus and mercury in the tubes uh, with led lights they could at least double the number of lights yeah at the time that those put in uh, we're going back paul to 2001 2002 so and, they didn't uh, exist they yeah. didn't exist exactly um but but what we did try and do paul was we we had a choice of cfls to use we could use the in Nepali, they call them nakali, so the copies made in China. Very, very low cost, but with a lot of harmonic noise in, in them. Uh, and a very sort of, you know, the characteristics is not just resistive, it's, you know, uh, horrible, a lot of spiky noise on it, which caused it with other things. Or to get the sort of, you know, Philips CFLs made in China. And they cost four or five times the amount, but they were brilliant. They lasted a lot longer. But yes, of course, today we could make that one kilowatt go way, way further by using LED technology. I use the ones from Poundland. Yeah. <laughs> Vic, I think, did you have a question? You have to unmute yourself. You're muted, Dick. I'll ask you to unmute. There we are. That's it. Yep. Thank you. Um, John, you showed a very helpful diagram at the beginning showing how all the successive efficiencies compounded with each other. So that at the end of the stream you illustrated, the available power was half what might have been expected in a perfect system. Have you found sometimes that the effect of such accumulation has given a serious problem because, for example, you haven't been able to get the generator you wanted but have had to make do with another, or perhaps the losses in the penstock turn out to be much bigger than expected. Has that ever been a big problem? Yes, it can be an enormous problem because um, if, the, um, if money has been borrowed to um, pay for the scheme, um, the lender is expecting a certain generation in order to produce a certain amount of income in order for the operator to pay the loan back um, and the developer might be over optimistic uh, i'm sure no cd engineers are over optimistic we're all should or should be fairly conservative but um that can happen and then there can be engineers um we ourselves can make mistakes and um basically maybe size the pen stock too small one size too small or whatever um, the transmission line uh, one size one or two sizes too small and then um, losses are higher than expected when you come to commissioning and a very very important part of the commissioning process is is, is the performance testing uh, and that's something I've done a lot of but for Welsh Water 
because Welsh Water in the contract, they would just simply say, right, you've got to do a performance test and you've got a guarantee. We in Dulas, we actually had to give performance guarantees with financial penalties if we didn't make it. Now, I can tell you that really focused my mind on making sure that um, it was properly designed through um, because I not only made the performance predictions, but I was the one who actually had to test them <laughs> with the Welsh engineers, Welsh water engineers breathing down my neck. Um, of course, I couldn't do what well, I couldn't sort of say, be too safe and say, oh, yes, this will produce 100 kilowatts, knowing that I designed it for 110. Because if we if we did the testing and we could produce 110, they'd say you said it could do 100, but it's doing much more. You don't know how to do your job. <laughs> so I used to get it in the neck both ways. Um, but that's in the West. Yes, you, you, you would um, it would be covered off in the contracts. And that would that would make sure generally that what it produced was what it should produce. Um, but we've got to be very careful that we're not too optimistic and we don't make mistakes in um, in sizing up those the different components. And of course, you don't see it till they all come together, um, and then you're suddenly measuring the power output, having put a flow meter on so that you can measure the flow, which is vital, um, and then. Uh, you can see what you really, you know, have got. Yes, am I allowed a rider? Um, I just want to mention that occasionally factors beyond our control cause a problem. And in Tanzania, for example, for a long time, it was impossible to buy anything that wasn't Chinese. And that made procurement very difficult. Another thing that happens sometimes is that somebody else you can't control makes an engineering decision without realizing it mm. and for example installs a plastic pipe instead of a metal one and doesn't realize that the diameter is measured outside instead of inside <laughs> have you had that kind of experience yes I, I find one of the one of the biggest problems is that these things are expensive uh, and um, in the early days during the development phase um, one of the first questions that the um, the sponsor or the uh, the developer asks is what is the budget for this and it's very very difficult to give a budget accurately because and the, the human nature is always to underestimate the true costs um, how do you do the budget because you haven't designed it you only got an outline design and that's subject to the permissions, the, the permissions, the, you know, the regulating authorities may force you to change things. The developer may force you to change things and make unwise choices. Um, but the best, the, the, the best way of budgeting, as, as, as I'm sure most of us know, is when you get tendered costs. Well, you can't get a tendered cost until you've got a, you know, a, a drawing which is for construction. And you can draw it for construction until you've started the design and build process. So it's all very, um, you know, it tends to be quite, quite difficult and you need to allow contingency. Um, but there is always that, that um, uh, you know, uh, balancing act between um, getting it specified properly, um, but not overdoing it so that there's unnecessary cost. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, that's why it's sometimes good to have a peer, um, you know, certainly for CD projects. Um, I try and work with Jonathan Appleby quite closely, but it, it's much better to have peers working peer to peer so someone can check what you've done and ideally um, maybe come up with better ideas um, than you have for doing something um, that both saves cost and is, is better for other reasons. Okay. Perhaps one just last last question before we before we conclude. If anyone has has one, if you have one, you need to unmute your microphone. Okay, I think if I take it, that's uh, yeah. a no from yeah. everyone. Just a quickie. Oh. All right. <laughs> Quickly, Michael, at the beginning, um, John, you were saying about the methods of um, uh, GIS survey, and there was one which was free. 
How is that spelt or? It's spelt Q G I S. Thank you. And it is used by, I was put onto it by um, a friend from church who, who's um, a lecturer in the geography department at Aberystwyth University. Uh, and he said to me, why don't you use QGIS? And he trains his, his students using QGIS. Um, and there's a, I learned a lot from um, a Dutch um, hydrologist who does lots of online, um, you know, on, online webinars. Um, how to use it properly um, so it's, it's what they call open source um, but it's not just that the program is free it's it's the resources that you need to download the DEMs so that the DEM stands for digital elevation model you can get DEM from literally anywhere in the world and you could download it from NASA for free so you download the right DEMs and you then uh, get QGIS to process those digital elevation models Typically, what we want to know is the catchment area. And it's quite a long process, but it's, um, you can then calculate. Once you know the catchment area, you can use um, rainfall, gauge, gauge data, river data from a, you know, a, a gauge station quite a long way away from where you are, uh, where you want to know it. And you can then, you can ratio on, uh, on catchment area and one or two other things to get a pretty good starting point as to how much water you've got. I think I sense another CED tech talk coming up on um, QGIS um, because uh, with a lot of things uh, like um, you know measuring catchment areas, you know it's quite old-fashioned really in terms of getting a map and then drawing where the uh, watershed is and then break it into squares or estimating it. So it sounds very good for that. So I like the sound of that. So an another uh, another tech talk coming up in, in the next series, perhaps. Um, Robert, you gave, gave the game away that you might have some knowledge of it. So um, you might uh, be somebody we turn to <laughs> for, uh, or your friend at Aberystwyth. We'll, we'll be looking for an expert on that. I might but pass you on to... So he, that's how he actually lectures in it. Excellent. So, yeah. uh, I could probably pass uh, contact details between the two if you wish. Just just ask him if he might be interested in it. I think that would be good, and then and then let us know because I think we're we're always interested in uh, improving our knowledge, and um, it's it's this seems a great forum for doing it, doesn't it? So so yeah. thank thank you, Robert. And, no and thank, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jono. Um, and thank you to everyone who's participated tonight. Um, don't forget that the, um, the video of this, uh, once it's uploaded, will be on our website, CD's website. We've got a new section called resources on the website. The website, if you don't know it, is cd.org.uk. It's very simple. And... Um, just uh, a reminder that our next talks, uh, we've got one on Monday, the 8th of February, uh, which is with Philip Tibenderana, who's our part-time engineer in Uganda. And he's going to be speaking on, well, bringing a, a Ugandan perspective on development. And then our last one uh, on Monday, the 8th of March, is going to be Jonathan Appleby talking about engineering and disasters. So thank you. I'm going to stop the recording.